Last time I met with you, we were discussing the changing nature of the American economy. I had told you how industrialization was really reshaping uh, not only the American economy, but a lot of elements of American politics along with it. Uh, we found out that uh, people had begun to make this connection that when government acts, a lot of times that can hit you in your pocketbook and there's winners and losers in those decisions. Today, what I want to talk about would be the reaction of workers, working class Americans, to uh, the industrialization of the economy in the late 19th century. Um, the last time we met, we, we were talking about how workers were treated, what their pay was, and, and, and the long story short when it comes to that is it wasn't very good. Right? But I also want to make, make it be known that workers were not simply passive victims in this process of industrialization. They fought back in a number of different ways. Let me give you two very good examples right now. Um, a particularly violent way that workers fought back um, in, involved a group in Pennsylvania known as the Molly McGuire's. The Molly Maguires was a group of Irish and Irish American coal miners in Pennsylvania, and they didn't have a whole lot of weapons at their disposal when it comes to politics or finances or anything like that, so they turned to just raw, unabashed violence. What they would do uh, to get their points across would be to burn down some of their uh, employer's buildings. In other cases, bomb them. Some more of the extreme cases, they would kidnap uh, some of their employers and ransom them back to the company. Ultimately, the Molly Maguires were broken apart, but they do represent a very vivid example of working class resistance. Another good example that we uh, might point to would be the Great Uprising of 1877. This was a massive railroad strike, and at its height, at its peak, it had shut down all railroad traffic west of the Mississippi River. And think about that for a second. Think about if all air traffic was shut down west of the Mississippi River, what that would do to the American economy, what that would do to the global economy, right? They resisted in a number of different ways. They resisted in work stoppages and boycotts. They restricted various forms of output. And you really have to ask yourself, how could all of this happen? Because keep in mind, their employers, the Andrew Carnegie's, the John Rockefellers of the world, they controlled all the cards, right? They had all the power. They had all the money. They also had all the politics in their back pocket. So how could this come to pass? Well, one explanation that's a lot of times overlooked, in my opinion anyway, would be space. Where workers lived, where they hung out, where they went for recreation. Their neighborhoods were bastions of collectivity. I'm going to give you three very good examples when it comes to this. One would be stores. If you happen to be a Jewish immigrant worker in New York and you were practicing Jew and you wanted to make matzo bread, that kind of stuff wasn't available on every street corner. Um, you would probably have to go see a Jewish grocer, which probably lived in the same neighborhood that you lived. And if you're a little bit light in terms of grocery money for that week, uh, there's a very good chance that that grocer would have floated you the cash, primarily because he needed you, you needed him. You're all in this boat together. So stores are a good example of this collective culture uh, that's emerging with industrialization. Saloons, another very good example, right? Now, when I say saloons, you probably think of your more modern-day bars, clubs sort of things, and they were a little bit of that, uh, you know, sporting scene, adult beverages, all that good stuff. But they also functioned as working-class banks in the late 19th century. Think about this for a second. What you need to cash a check or to go make a deposit or whatever, you need a bank account. And if you're reading The Jungle, as I hope you are, um, you, you probably are of the persuasion that people like Jurgis Rudkus, uh, they don't have an account at Citibank, right? Um, as a matter of fact, if you want an example from the jungle, there's a point in that book where he stumbles across a hundred dollar bill and he knew that he needed to break it, but the problem was he also knew he couldn't walk into a bank and ask them to do it. They would think that he robbed somebody, ragtag looking guy like himself, he robbed somebody. He couldn't take it to a fancy department store even if he agreed to buy a suit 
place like Marshall Fields, they, they, they would assume the same thing that the bank thought, right? There was one place in all of Chicago that he thought he could take it and have a chance of having it broken for him, and that was the saloon. He took it to the saloon, he, he, he bought a meal, bought a, a round for himself, and the barkeeper agreed to break the $100 bill to change it out for him. So saloons are, are very important in terms of working class life, especially when it comes to resistance. But the big one, guys, that would be churches, right? I want to say that, I mean that very broadly defined. Places of worship is really what I mean. Um, for the Catholics coming over, the Italians, the Russians, the Poles, that would be the Catholic Church, um, you see numerous Protestant churches that play the same role. In the Jewish community, you see the Jewish temple that would play the role of uh, you know, organizational hub. Uh, where people met to talk strategy, what was going to go on at work, what was going to be the plan of action for the Great Union Drive. These were all places that were occupied by workers. Maybe more importantly, those were places that their bosses would not be caught dead, right? These are places that their bosses, their employers just simply did not go. But when you're talking about the institution of working class resistance, there had been a long history of that in this country, long before the late 19th century. Um, we see the formation of unions, working class organizations that uh, bargain collectively with their employers for better pay, shorter work days, that sort of thing. And they emerge relatively early in American economic history. But there's a particular flavor to these unions by this point in, in history. And it's what historians call craft unions. Now, in order to be in the craft union, you had to be a craftsman, in emphasis on the word man. What a craftsman had done was spent years and years of his life to um, learn a particular trade, to become a blacksmith or to become a butcher, if you want an example, from the jungle. If you're following along the PowerPoint with me, that's a shoemaker that you're looking at right there. But here's the thing about getting your foot in the door. To become an apprentice, not only did you have to be a man, but you also had to be white. And as I pointed out the last time we met, people like Jurgis Rudkiss, immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe, would not have been considered white. That's fine, resistance is resistance, but think about how reflective craft unionism is to the bigger, broader, working class community. Think about the people that are working in the factories alongside Jurgis. They're generally of immigrant stock. Many of them are people of color. A good portion of them are women. Many more of them are children. None of these people would have been included when it comes to the unionization in craft unions, right? So what I want you to write down in your notes next to craft unionism is it was very exclusive, and I don't mean that in a good way. It excluded many, many Americans that would have gladly taken union protection and probably made pretty good union members, but because these unions were essentially racist and sexist institutions, they're excluding a great big portion of the working class community. An institution that is far more inclusive would be the group that you're looking at on the screen right there, the Holy Order of the Knights of Labor, or more succinctly, just the Knights of Labor. The Knights are led by a guy named Terence V. Powderly, and he is a blacksmith by trade. Up until 1869, the, the Knights of Labor are a secret underground society. In 1869, Powderly is going to take the Knights out from the shadows, and he's going to begin to organize very publicly and, and very much in front of their employers, but very differently than the craft unions have tried thus far. What the Knights of Labor are driving at here is inclusivity. Write that down. The Knights of Labor were very inclusive. They wanted to organize everybody. Organize skilled workers like the butchers. Organize unskilled workers like the gut shovelers, Jurgis. Organize men. Organize women. Organize people that were native-born Americans. Organize people that were of immigrant stock organize people of color, organize everybody. It was unionism for all, right? Maybe more importantly, what the Knights of Labor offered was a political voice for workers. 
right? Collectively, these people were powerful. Their voices were a force to be reckoned with. If they all stood up in unison and said, we want shorter work days, we want better working conditions, then, then bosses had to listen. This was a serious contention. And it will become a national movement. Certainly by the mid-1880s, the Knights of Labor are, are not only a force within the American economy, they're, they're really beginning to near their peak of influence, their high point of influence. In 1886, the Knights of Labor decided that they needed a central issue to organize around. And what they found was the eight-hour day. Now, you and I take the eight-hour day almost for granted. I mean, that's pretty typical the the American workday in our day and age, but it hadn't always been, right? Most Americans worked 12 hours. Um, you know, there was nothing that said that they couldn't work you longer than that, but generally speaking, that was the experience of most people, 12 hours. The Knights of Labor argued for eight, right? Now, obviously, this was a more humane workday, okay? Obviously, there's that, but that was not what made the eight-hour push brilliant, right? Um, the, the brilliance is you had three eight-hour shifts, right? Or as the Knights saw it, you had eight hours for work, you would have eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what you will, eight hours for recreation. This provided us a higher standard of living for the American working class. But even again, that was not what it made it so brilliant. What made it brilliant was that if you are Andrew Carnegie and you want to keep Homestead Steel open morning, noon, and night, if you want to do that, and by law, you can only legally work a worker for eight hours, and then by law, you've got to send that person home. The only other recourse to keep that factory open is to hire more workers, right? You've got to reach out into that job pool, right, and bring people that heretofore were unemployed, bring them in and put them in the paid labor force. What that's going to do, guys, is it's going to lower the amount of unemployed labor. And anytime you have less of something, you have less labor, you've got less gasoline, you've got less whatever it is that you're talking about, the price is going to go up. It's a simple supply and demand sort of concept. The fewer and fewer workers there are to go around, the more and more you're going to pay them. So workers are getting more money in their paychecks. That, that's good. But what's even better is that when these workers start working and start bringing home money, they spend it. Right? What, what generally, what ordinary Americans do when you give them money is they spend it, and that creates something that economists call demand. What demand creates would be jobs. It creates a healthier economy, and that's really what made the Knights of Labor so brilliant when it comes to organizing around this eight-hour workday. They want the federal government to mandate the eight-hour workday, and they wanted it to start in Chicago. Chicago was the industrial capital of the United States. And in particular, they wanted it to start at a place called the McCormick Reaper Works in Chicago. The thought being, if we can just start it out there in McCormick, we can get the rest of Chicago to fall in line. And if we can get the rest of Chicago to go, then so will go the rest of the country. But it all starts at McCormick. By this point, radicals had taken over the Knights of Labor. I'm talking about socialists. Uh, people that wanted a much more planned economy. I'm talking about anarchists, people that wanted to destroy the government as we knew it. They had taken the lead on this. And in particular, there was a guy that was originally from South Texas, a guy by the name of um, Alfred Parsons. Parsons is going to take the lead on this. And much of this is, you know, being organized around the 1st of May, May Day, what would come to be International Workers' Day. And there's a big rally um, um, right before May Day in 1886. It, uh, it was at McCormick Reapers, and the Chicago Police Department was on hand that particular occasion just to make sure that nothing got out of hand. And, and basically what they told Parsons and the rest of his crowd was, you don't got to go home, but you can't stay here, right? You need to disperse. And so what Parsons said to everybody is, let's meet back the following day, May 1st. We're going to have another rally, this time in Haymarket Square, public 
public property, right? Haymarket was sort of this beehive of political activism in Chicago at the time. But we're going to demonstrate that we mean business. So everybody meets back the following day. And it, again, if you're looking at the PowerPoint, you probably have an idea as to what's going to come next. We don't know who, although we've got a pretty good idea, but somebody tossed a pipe bomb into the crowd. And when it exploded, it killed four Chicago police officers. This was a problem. It was a problem because it allowed the establishment to come back after these workers, especially leaders like Parsons, right? Xenophobia, the fear of foreigners, the fear of people that come from somewhere else. Workers had always had this xenophobic uh, tinge to them, considering many people, Jurgis Rudkus included, came from somewhere else. But what the Haymarket Affair came to define the labor movement as was violent, illegal, right? Not legitimate, and it needed to be dealt with not only, not, not only directly, but harshly as well. And so in the aftermath of the Haymarket Affair, the leaders are rounded up, people like Parsons, they're put on trial, and even though there's not a lot of very solid evidence, they're all executed for their role in the Haymarket Affair. This is going to completely take the wind, the momentum, out of the sails of the labor movement, and in particular the Knights of Labor. A good example would be a guy that was a cigar roller, a guy named Samuel Gompers. Gompers was the leader of his Cigar Rollers Union, which was an actual skilled worker position. It was not you know, automated. You had to learn the trade. And you had to spend years of your life learning how to do this. Gompers was a card-carrying member of the Knights of Labor, but in the aftermath of the Haymarket Affair, he's going to take his cigar rollers out. He's going to lead those guys out, and he's going to form a new labor working class organization. It's called the American Federation of Labor. It's still around today, right? The AF of L would be this new working class organization that would fight for the rights of workers, but there was a catch. Much like Gompers, you had to be a skilled worker, right? You had to belong to a craft. You had to spend your life uh, dedicated to that craft. And as we've already pointed out, most people uh, of the late 19th century variety would not have been welcomed in the craft. So yes, it is a very effective form of um, resistance, but it's not very reflective of the general working class. If you're keeping score, it's worker zero, boss is one. The next round is going to come to us in western Pennsylvania, in particular Homestead, Pennsylvania. And that was the site of Andrew Carnegie's Homestead Steel Works, the, the epicenter of Carnegie's steel empire, right? In 1892, Carnegie declared war on one of the most powerful, well-organized, and well-funded unions in, in the United States at the time. That would be the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers. Um, he turns to his plant manager, a guy named Henry Frick, and he says, Frick, I don't care how you do it or what you have to do to do it, but I want you to get rid of every last union member in this, in, in this factory. I want them gone. Um, Frick's a pretty resourceful guy. And he knows that he can't tell a union worker from a non-union worker. It's not like they identify themselves. So to make sure that he gets all of them, he fires everybody. You all are fired. Every the last one of you that works here in Homestead, you're all fired. But don't worry, I'll hire you all back tomorrow as long as you sign an agreement that you'll never join the union. Well, this infuriated the union members who very much intended to remain card-carrying, dues-paying union members. And so what the workers did um, after they had left the factory is they formed a barricade around the factory and shut it down. This is a, this is a work stoppage. They were determined not to allow uh, replacement workers to go back into the factory. The idea being choking off Carnegie's ability to produce is going to cost him money. If it costs him money, he's going to be willing to negotiate, and that might mean that he'll recognize the union, right? You literally have bosses shooting at workers and workers returning fire. Workers brought bricks and bats to the job front. Um, they brought guns, and in some cases, they brought cannon to, 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 the, to the work stoppage, to the strike. And ultimately, what Henry Frick is going to do, this is going to become important. Right? 
he's going to call the governor. And what he's going to say is, Governor, we think that you're doing a great job out here in western Pennsylvania. We'd love to make a sizable donation to your re-election bid, but we do have this little problem that we would like you to take care of. We have some workers that, in our opinion, are illegally uh, occupying our private property. And the next thing you know, you've got the Pennsylvania State Militia that has been mobilized by the governor. And because they're semi-professional soldiers and the homestead strikers are ragtag strikers, workers, you don't have to have a PhD in military science to figure out who's going to win this one, right? Um, it's now worker zero bosses two. The intervention of the state, in this case the militia, broke the strike. They were able to force their way back in and replace the striking workers with replacement workers. Homestead reopened, and when it did, it reopened 100% union free. Andrew Carnegie and Henry Frick had clearly won that round. The last round. 1894, you're going to see a strike outside of Chicago, and it's going to center on the Pullman Riding Car Company. George C. Pullman was the president of this company, and what they did is they made very luxurious, very fancy train riding cars. It was like a hotel on wheels, right? It was made by your Jurgis Rudkiss types, people that were overworked, were underpaid, were used, were exploited, were abused, right? Only this had a special twist. Pullman, much like Carnegie, wanted to control every element of the process of production, including workers' private lives. Pullman actually owned the town in which these workers lived. He called it Pullman Town, right? But he owned the apartment that you rented. He owned the trolley that you went back and forth to work at, right? He owned the grocery store in which you shopped. And when you got paid, you didn't get paid in cold, hard cash. You got paid in what was called Pullman Script. It, 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 it could be redeemed at your Pullman stores, um, but it was basically monopoly money. It was good nowhere else. So you can imagine that the prices inside these Pullman-owned stores were sky high. They had a monopoly and they knew it, right? Well, by 1894, the workers had had enough. Pullman decided he was going to raise rent and he was not going to give the workers a raise to offset that uh, increase in the cost of living. And they had enough. They threw up their hands. They went to a guy that was a very brilliant union organizer, a guy named Eugene V. Debs. As a matter of fact, Debs had played a very important role in that um, great uprising strike of 1877. But more importantly, Debs is the current president of the American Railroad Workers Union, a very well-organized and well-respected union in, in working-class circles. And they go to him and they say, we want you to take the lead in this Pullman strike. We've had enough. We're up to our eyeballs and debt. We, we want you to lead us, right? And Deb says, I can't. And you need to go back to work because I'm not ready yet. You're not ready yet. I need time to organize you. And they said, it's too late for that. You got us whether you want us or not. What Debs is going to try to do is make the best of a not great situation. And what he does is he calls a boycott. Right? He tells his ARW men, do not service any train in this country that has even one Pullman car on it. And because there were Pullman cars north, south, east, and west, similar to 1877, it ground all railroad traffic almost to a screeching halt. Pullman is getting heat from all over the place. He's getting heat from his people. He's getting heat from uh, people on the outside. You know, you're stopping my business. You're interfering with my business. You know, I can't move my product, and you're the reason why. I don't care what you need to do, but you need to settle with your workers, right? You would think that Pullman would roll over, but you don't exactly know this guy very well. He's going to pull a page out of Henry Frick's playbook. He calls the president, a guy named Grover Cleveland. He says, Cleveland, we think you're doing a great job out here in Chicago. That ought to sound familiar. And we'd love to make a sizable donation to your re-election bid, but we've got this little labor management dispute. We sure would appreciate your help in the matter. And the next thing you know, you've got the National Guard that has been mobilized. And what the National Guard is going to do is they're going to break the strike, right? They're going to arrest Gene Debs, um, charging him with violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. 
What that law says was you can't interfere with the flow of goods or people from one state to another. And clearly by sponsoring this boycott, they were, they were interfering with interstate travel, and that was a violation of federal law, and Debs went to prison for it. Debs is going to go to prison, and, and prison would actually um, refine his politics, if you will, and I don't mean that in a good or bad way, I just mean that he's going to evolve. And two things are going to happen upon his release. Number one, he's going to become probably the most well-known, certainly most important, of the Socialist Party officials. He's going to be a real big mover and shaker within the Big S Socialist Party. He'll run for president on a number of different occasions, and he's going to do quite well for himself. The other thing that he's going to be instrumental in doing is founding that organization that you're looking at at the bottom of the screen there, and that'd be the Industrial Workers of the World. Now, the IWW, they don't want to form unions within the railroad industry or anything like that. They want to form one massive international union, and then when the timing is right, call a general strike and cripple governments. It's not just one industry or another that's going to crumble. We're talking about governments all around the world. And so the IWW is going to be more or less the brainchild of Eugene V. Debs, and it's going to be a result of this tumult in the economy in the late 19th century. Um, things like the Haymarket Affair, the, the Homestead Strike, and as we've just got done describing the Pullman Strike, are all going to be very important when it comes to this situation. Let me wrap this up for you. What you've got here in the late 19th century is workers fighting back. They're, they're, not, they're not rolling over here, they're not taking this lying down, they're fighting back. And not only are their bosses fighting them, the, their bosses are using the power that would be the government, right? I mean, for all of their talk about keep government out of business, businessmen were quite fond of the uses of government that could help them, and, and certainly quelling, squelching, you might even say, labor conflict, labor discontent, was a very useful mechanism, tool, if you will, for, for, for businessmen like uh, George Pullman. This is really going to come to define labor relations for the next at least 30 years, um, and even then, you'll see the very violent repression um, many times at the hands of the government against working class activism. But I'm hopeful that you can see that this really gets its start in the late 19th century in the middle of the Gilded Age. Now, the next time we meet, we're going to talk about the process of immigration, because as you're going to find out, urbanization, the rapid development of these cities, has a direct connection with industrialization. It's in these cities that the factories are clustering, and it obviously has a huge connection to immigration. It's not only immigrants that are filling cities like Chicago and New York, it's immigrants that are taking these jobs. You'll see what I mean the next time we meet. For right now, that's all we've got.